Thanks, Julie. Uh, pleasure to be here for the last panel. We're going to have a, a lively evening as well, I know, uh, with Dominic Barton. We'll have an opportunity to socialize a little bit after this panel. So we recognize we're right before the drinks, but this is a, as Amanda Lang said, it wasn't a sexy topic, infrastructure. We disagree. I think Bill Morneau was thinking sexiness is not really the issue. It's fundamentally about economic vitality. We also agree with that. So we're going to have a, a good discussion. As Julie said, um, I'm Drew Fagan. I uh, was working on the, uh, the Public Policy Forum uh, project on infrastructure. There are going to be a couple more roundtables coming, one in Toronto on innovation, another in Vancouver in early November, and we'll issue a final report. Um, I would think in the middle of November, but I think the fundamentals of, uh, of what we're looking at have been written in the interim report. If you have any thoughts uh, with regard to that, there are various means of getting that uh, to us, uh, to me and, and through Julie and others that shouldn't be uh, uh, too much of a challenge. I want to start off by introducing the distinguished panel. Um, Jaden Bird, right beside me, is Senior Business Advisor of Complex Public and Private Construction and Infrastructure at Bennett Jones in Vancouver. Notably, she's the former CEO of the 19-kilometer Canada Line Rapid Transit System in Vancouver and region, and before that was the, uh, the CEO of Columbia Power Corporation. Uh, beside Jane uh, is Bert Clark, who I know well from my uh, time in Ontario. He's the president and CEO of Infrastructure Ontario, a position he's had for about four years. Um, some of you may know this is his last week in that position. Um, he's taking over a very exciting new role in Ontario next week, in fact, as the first head of the Investment Management Corporation of Ontario. If you don't know what that is, think about AIMCO in Alberta and creating the same kind of institution in Ontario, something that the Ontario government announced earlier this year. And Bert is, in fact, the first employee. So I think Mundy is going out to buy pens and paper. Um, Don Farrell, uh, at, the, uh, at the end of the panel, great to have Don here, President and CEO of TransAlta Corporation, so more than 30 years of experience in the electrical energy industry at TransAlta and BC Hydro, and I would note uh, that she's on the board of the Business Council of Canada and the Conference Board of Canada. So here's how we're going to do this. We're each going to talk, I think, for about four or five minutes off the top, some general ideas with regard to the importance of infrastructure, thinking about it in terms of delivery, thinking about it in terms of sector, thinking about it in terms of projects, terms of thinking about it in terms of economic importance, particularly at a time when the federal government is thinking about infrastructure in a very big way, as Minister Morneau was talking about at lunchtime, to boost long-term economic growth, and I know that, in fact, is the, uh, is the, uh, the topic uh, at hand for this panel. Tom Jenkins, so each of us will talk for four or five minutes. I'll then um, ask uh, the other panelists um, some pertinent questions, hopefully pertinent questions, and then we'll open it up to you for a conversation. I think we'll have a little get, bit of uh, give and take during our own part as well. I would note, and let, let me just start for a second for a few minutes, I would note that a number of panelists have brought up infrastructure, not just Minister Morneau in talking about a federal agency uh, at lunchtime or you know, suggesting the idea of some, some sort of national organization. Michael Sabia focusing on it in a big way this morning with regard to the importance of innovation, the size of the spend and the capacity to really drive that for long-term growth, and Tom Jenkins right off the top. So let me give you a little bit of context, and some of this comes out of the infrastructure report that, uh, that you have that I wrote over the last month or so. You know, the federal government has doubled the federal infrastructure spend. It was $60 billion over 10 years, roughly, under the previous government. It's now $120 billion over 10 years under the liberal government. As a piece of context, the federal government was spending about $1 billion a year at the turn of the century on infrastructure. It's a remarkable change. And it's not just the federal government, it's really all levels of government. And in fact, it's pretty much all governments in the Western world which have been boosting their spends on infrastructure, recognizing that after a period in the 80s 
and the 90s, when we really didn't spend on infrastructure, when we really didn't keep up our assets of the type of construction and development that you know, the modern Western world uh, built in the 50s and 60s, that changed around the turn of the century. Now we have a fairly robust spend, but I would emphasize that that $120 billion is just a small part of the total spend of all three levels of government. We estimated at the, in the report, planned over the next 10 years, of about $500 billion to as much as $750 billion. And that's about 4% of GDP. 4% of GDP is close to the kind of spend we had in the 50s and 60s. When, as I said, modern Canada, the modern states, the interstate highway system, hospitals and education facilities in Canada was built. So we're, and 4% of GDP actually compares fairly well across the OECD in terms of the level of spend. But I would suggest, and mention this in the report, that there are other metrics where we're not keeping up as much. Our so-called capital intensity, which is the amount of infrastructure for every dollar of GDP, is actually on the low side within the G7 and within the major countries of the OECD as well. And we've got relatively weak market signals. And by that, I mean the necessity of doing proper ROI, return on investment analysis, for all projects over a certain size. Or the willingness to bring the private sector, as Michael Sabia was talking about this morning, in appropriate circumstances into the investment picture so that it's kind of an all hands on deck approach rather than fundamentally publicly owned and publicly delivered. And we haven't have taken already significant steps in that regard. Bert, Bert will talk that, about that in the context of P3s in particular but there are further steps that we can take. And I would also suggest that if you compare Canada to other countries, the political overlay is actually fairly strong. The responsibility of politicians to make these long-term decisions is fairly heavy. So some suggestions made in the paper very quickly, a pan-Canadian infrastructure strategy working with the other levels of government, a pan-Canadian infrastructure agency to build best practices, to coordinate across government, to facilitate private sector investment where appropriate, to ensure that there's public metrics and reporting to the public with regard to how well po uh, projects are being delivered and operated. Greater variance in the means of delivering projects, including public and private uh, ownership and delivery. Greater focus on digital infrastructure and innovation with regard to infrastructure delivery and not just the same old ways and other steps as well. So I would sum it up by saying it's a really exciting time in terms of infrastructure. We have a robust world-class spend. Now we've got to make sure that we have a really robust world-class capacity to deliver that infrastructure. I think that's the conversation going on very much behind the scenes in Ottawa right now. So that's my opening. Jane, if you could, just uh, a little bit of uh, a, a sense of the same sorts of issues, but from your perspective, please, reading have been right at the, uh, the cool face. Thanks very much. Um, all of these themes, I think, seem to be circling around, but let me just um, talk a little bit about how I think about them. And I think w what we're talking about is, is two parts. One part is how to pick the right projects, and as I think, Bert, you put it, the second part is how to do them well. And I think we've got a long way to go on picking the right projects. Um, sometimes we get them right, and sometimes we don't. And we've definitely got a long way to go on how to de deliver them well. And uh, for me, um, there are three kind of aspects of those two parts of the equation that um, I think are paramount. The first is performance metrics. The second is governance. And the third is capacity. And again, sounds like this morning you started to touch on some of those themes, but maybe I can sort of bring it down to a more practical uh, application. Um, performance. I think that part of the issue around particularly big projects is that we don't spend as much time as we might figuring out what it is we actually want to buy. What it is we're trying to achieve with these investments besides just having said we did an investment for its own sake. And I think that's partly because many of the big projects, and I'll speak specifically about transportation, but I think the same is true of health, although it's certainly not my sector, but I think it's a fair statement about health too. Most of those projects start out in the transportation or the transit planning agencies. And all the transportation planners and the transit engineers plan those projects. And they do a heck of a job of it. 
but they don't generally speaking, partly because of their profession, partly because of the context in which the, these projects are born, they don't generally put what I would call a commercial lens on it. They don't generally ask, well, wait a minute, is there a return that's available here? What's the commercial reality of this project? Could we do a slightly different project and tweak that commercial reality? They don't think that way. That's not what, that's not what they generally do. And by the time, I said in a seminar the other day, by the time the projects come up to the commercial lens, it's because a bunch of transportation guys are praying like heck it's going to get through Treasury Board. And that is pretty much the only time that you really get a kind of commercial lens. And if you can turn that on its head and you can start to do that commercial analysis at the same time, at the same time as you're doing the transportation planning analysis, I think we might end up with some different kinds of projects and a slightly different, um, more refined, if I could put it that way, more rigorous uh, analytical uh, underpinning. My experience on Canada Line, we were fortunate um, from that perspective because it was a very well studied project that had been on the books for a long time. And when my team arrived, we really started with a commercial lens. So it had quite a lot of commercial anal analysis. It was one of the first big P3s. And so for that reason, it kind of demanded a rigor uh, to get it across the board. And so I think it benefited from that analysis. It also benefited from my second kind of passion, which is um, governance when it comes to these projects. And we're switching now a little bit from how to choose the right projects to that second part, which is how to do them well. And I think that, uh, I think I'm going to go out there and say most, most of the problems, the big problems on big projects can be traced to a large degree back to governance. And by governance, I mean understanding what decisions need to be made, understanding who needs to make them, and doing so in a way that allows them to be made on a timely basis. And you can pick 15 projects in the country right now that are either doing well because they've got a good governance mechanism in place or not so well because they don't. And I think um, the federal government, indeed senior governments, uh, do have a role to play in saying, if we're going to build this, how are we going to do that? It, again, if you have private sector money, as I'm sure you heard this morning, uh, it sort of begs the question and it, it allows for probably that governance lens to be put over the project sooner rather than later, which I think is a good thing. Um, and again, going back to my experience on Canada Line, I had four levels of government uh, and the private sector. And, and because of that, it was sort of, it was sort of turning um, uh, a sow's ear into a silk purse, if I could put it that way. Because, because they, no one really trusted each other, we, could design, we designed a governance model that everybody bought into, but it created a very clear uh, series of decisions that were made by the so-called shareholders or funders in that case versus the decisions that were made by a management team that reported to our board of directors. And because we spent the time figuring that out, because we had to, to get the buy-in of all the governments, uh, it, it made for really quite smooth sailing from a decision-making perspective. And that leaves me with my, my third element, which is capacity. And I think, again, you've probably um, talked a little bit about it. I know we've talked about it a little bit in preparation for this panel, and it certainly comes up in your report, around the need to um, beef up our capacity uh, on the government side for sure um, to deliver these projects effectively. Uh, it's a, it, it, there is a dearth, I will say, both in the private sector and especially in government, I'd be interested in Bert's comments on this, um, around uh, of really, really sophisticated, skilled uh, project managers. And when you look at just the sheer volume of projects, I know looking at British Columbia alone, that we've got either on the books or about to be on the books, and the depth that we have on the government side to manage those projects, um, it, is a, uh, it is a sobering um, prospect. Certain uh, provinces, I think, have done well, um, I.O. being a good example, and Partnerships BC as well, um, in starting to get some of that capacity on the government side, but it's an ongoing struggle. Great. Thank you. Bert, mention of I.O. I want to up on something you said, uh, Drew, because you know, Canadians, Canadians don't like to brag and uh, you know, get much more comfortable wringing our hands. Um, you know, but on infrastructure, I think in... in you know, over the last decade, we've actually made major leaps forward, at least in public infrastructure. So when I, you know, when I go to other jurisdictions, especially the U.S., they, their minds are blown by the amount of infrastructure that we have going on. So they, they, would, you know, they would find it hard to believe that in, in Ontario, a population of 13 million people, you have two nuclear uh, reactors being refurbished, both you know, 10 plus billion dollar jobs. We built multiple uh, extensions to the 407 billion dollar projects 
Uh, I.O. has built 55 buildings in the last uh, 10 years, valued at about $20 billion. There are three LRTs being built in the province right now, Waterloo, Ottawa, and Eglinton. The air rail link is complete. We've got three LRTs in procurement, Finch here Ontario and Mississauga and Hamilton. And the biggest project is still is just starting when that's the electrification of the GO network. There wouldn't be a, a U.S. state, regardless of their population, that could list that kind of uh, level of activity. So, you know, I think, I think we should act, that doesn't mean that we've addressed all areas, but we should actually feel pretty good about where, where we're at. Um, a bit about Infrastructure Ontario, we're a crown corporation, uh, so I report, at least for the next three days, to a board of uh, mostly private sector folks, uh, experts in finance, accounting, engineering, real estate. Uh, it's, a, it's a very, very good, good board of specialists. We do three things. Uh, first, we lend to municipalities, uh, and we essentially borrow from the province and on lend to municipalities at that, at that cost of funds. We don't aim to, aim to make money. Uh, the reason we do that is because in the, in the municipal sector, it's hard to access the capital markets on efficient terms. If you're going to buy a new fire engine uh, or, or put $5 million into your water sewer system, you cannot get one of the big banks to do a bond issue for you. And so they, they don't have access to efficient capital. For many years, that meant they either didn't do the work or, frankly, they looked to senior levels of government for grants. And at a certain point, the province said to a lot of them, you have less debt uh, on your balance sheet than us in relative terms. Why are you not borrowing and, and uh, anyway, develop this pooled lending scheme? So that's the first thing we do. The second thing we do is we manage the real estate portfolio for the province of Ontario. It's, it's the second biggest real estate portfolio in the country, second only to the federal portfolio. Uh, it looks a lot like the federal portfolio in the sense that it's old. It's gone through periods of, of, uh, of underinvestment. It's spread across the whole province. And frankly, um, you know, that it's, it, it hasn't been treated as something that's sexy. Uh, there's always been much more interest in new things than maintaining the old. Uh, we're just starting a process of, of renewing that, that, uh, that portfolio. And frankly, it's going to need to end up smaller and use more efficiently uh, so that the, 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 the portfolio, frankly, corresponds to the, the, the resources of the government and their, and their current needs. And the last thing we do is we manage the major projects on behalf of the province uh, and other public sector entities. And those are really projects over $100 million. Um, the genesis of that, that uh, division was 10 years ago, there was a, a huge need in the health capital sector in Ontario. The average age of a hospital was 42 years. You could not do in those hospitals what, you could not practice modern medicine in many ways in those hospitals but the, there was a very poor track record that the province had of delivering projects. They came in, uh, you know, it wasn't unusual to have a project come in 50, 75% over budget. So it, was, wasn't, it was, just wasn't realistic that they were going to, going to uh, start working their way through a huge long list of hospitals when they didn't know how to build them. They created an infrastructure, Ontario. Our mandate is to deliver those projects. Um, we play no role in picking the projects. Uh, we, we're very policy agnostic. We stick to, uh, we stick to project delivery. Those are, those are two very, very different skill sets. The, you know, what should you build versus building it. And the guys and women that we have uh, at I.O. Are, are project people. They like to build stuff. Uh, so we stay right away from that. Once the government decides that a, a, a court, a hospital, a road, an LRT project uh, needs to be built and the budget's been allocated, they hand it to us and our job is to get it done on time and on budget. So, as I mentioned at the outset, we've had a very, very busy decade. We've built 55 projects, uh, valued at about $20 billion. If we, we, uh, by using modern project delivery techniques, we've got a very strong track record. The, the vast, vast majority of them have been on budget. Those that have gone over have been, uh, uh, haven't gone over by much. And, uh, and about three quarters have been, been on time. Great. Dawn. Okay, well, I'm going to uh, take us in a slightly different direction because, just because I, I come from a different industry. So first of all, to the Public Policy Institute, I really um, appreciate the session that we're having here today. Um, it's been great to be part of the dialogue. And, you know, there's, a, there's always lots of things that come up through the course of the day that really start to... 
make you think about what we have to do uh, here collectively to make Canada competitive. Because I, I, I said to our panelists in the back room, I'm, I'm always interested in, in economies that think that they should be growing at 3 and 4% a year when the population is growing at 1.6 or 1.7%. Because effectively, you have, to, you have to hit over your weight to grow faster than your population. And you have to have a competitiveness strategy to do that. So when I think about infrastructure, my infrastructure is electricity. Um, electricity is infrastructure. It, you know, when you play Monopoly, it's when you land on the electric uh, thing, you only get 25 bucks. It, it really isn't the big, it's not boardwalk for sure. Uh, lately it's been Marvin Gardens actually. It's, uh, you can tell that I've been playing too much Monopoly with my grandchildren, but um, electricity is infrastructure and if it's done well, you never think about it. You in this room never think about it. In fact, if it's really done well, you have no problem stealing it. You run around with your plugins all over the world and you plug in and you just steal people's money because somebody's paying for that electricity because you think it's a public good and you think it's really inexpensive. Um, in Alberta, electricity is uh, privately funded and has been for 105 years. So it is not a public good. It's not set up, it's not funded by the government, it's not chosen by the government. We have a, an ISO that figures out the system there and we're, we're the sort of big generator in Alberta. Now a little bit about Transalta, we're 105 years old. We started in the 1900s uh, building hydro. Uh, we started building coal in the 50s. We built gas in the 80s. We built wind in the zeros and we just uh, bought our first solar farm last year. So we have uh, electricity across all the, uh, uh, the spectrum. We are a deregulated company now. The, the market was deregulated in Alberta and we have operations across Canada, uh, in the United States and in Australia. And uh, we're also the largest uh, renewable company in Canada with 1300 megawatts of wind, a little bit of solar and um, 1000 megawatts of hydro. So, um, you know, we've been, we've had to, we build all, almost all of our projects. We hardly ever acquire them. Uh, we have to put good governance in place to get them built correctly. But where I want to take us is a little bit in a different direction because, <clears throat> and, it, and it's really to give you the, the story about the future that we're in and what we're trying to create. And really, we're trying to take electricity from being uh, overly exciting to back to unexciting. And, and let me talk about that. So um, as you all know, last week the uh, federal government announced a $50 carbon tax the, a year before the Alberta government put in place the Carbon Leadership Plan, which did three things to our company. Um, it basically put a $30 carbon tax on, on coal. Uh, it brought 5,000 megawatts of renewables into the market over the next 10 years, and it, uh, which, which takes prices down significantly in our marketplace. And it, and it uh, mandates that our coal plants must be shut down by 2030. So just to put that in perspective from an infrastructure perspective, and I think um, uh, my panel members here will be interested in this, uh, we had a social license to operate and build a $1.7 billion coal plant that started up in 2011. Uh, in 2012, the federal government confirmed that uh, through the then climate policy that we had 50 years to run the plant and then it must shut down. And three years later in 2015, the provincial government mandated that it would be shut down by 2030. So we have a 60 year asset that will end up having 14 years of life. I call that disposable in infrastructure, but uh, uh, very, very expensive proposition. So that's the challenging part. The most interesting part is that in the next 15 years, Alberta will transition away from coal. We have 6,000 megawatts of coal in Alberta will transition towards gas and renewables, um, and we'll spend somewhere between 18 and $30 billion doing it, and it will be all private sector money. Uh, but the, there's some collision courses that we have to think about now in our sector, which I think is, uh, which is challenging, but, uh, but interesting if you're trying to get back to the infrastructure is boring and you're the place on the monopoly board where you just pass and get your 25 bucks. Now, let me talk about why I think electricity has to be boring because, and I think it's critically important. I think if you do a major study of all economies globally, you will find 
that the economies with the lowest cost and cleanest uh, electricity uh, over the longer term are much more successful, especially if they have significant reliability and lots of access. Um, electricity has become more and more important in a digitized age. You can't have all this, all this data running all over the world without almost perfect electricity systems. And you'll find that you can't have a manufacturing sector, you can't have an industrial sector. Um, it is really the heart and soul of the economy. And the lower cost it is, the cleaner it is, the more that you don't see it or hear about it or even know about it, the more likely you've got a pretty successful uh, business. So when we, we heard a, a panelist talk earlier this morning, and he said, well, you have to know your customer. And I do know our customers. And our customers are big mining companies, oil sands companies, uh, Costco's, 7-Elevens, and all of them say to us, make our electricity low cost and boring and clean, and don't bug us, just, you know, just send us the bill. Because if you do that, then we can build warehouses, and we can build big plants, and we can build big operations. So we really take that, that challenge seriously. So we see a couple of uh, collision courses coming on the transformation of the current capital stock and electricity into the new capital stock. The new capital stock will be much more re renewable, which means it'll be much more inter intermittent. And it's going to become much more difficult to figure out how to finance it. Now, we have provided our customers for 105 years with low-cost electricity because we could attract the lowest-cost capital because we were either regulated or we had long-term uh, very stable contracts. Those stable contracts, to give you an example today, you could finance in the debt markets at 35 to 4% on the debt side for about 70% of the project. That significantly takes the price of electricity down. The challenge and the collision course that we see is because of all the innovation and the technology that's come. So wind has come into play in the last 10 years. It's come down the cost curve dramatically. Solar has. Um, we have operations in Australia where we're building a gas plant. We think will be the last gas plant built in Australia because A, there'll be a carbon tax, in which case gas will just not be economic, and B, rooftop solar has, has swept the countryside there. So the, so the dilemma we're in is how to figure out in this transition from this world to the next world, how do we get the financing right? How do we get the time frame of the transition right? Um, so that effectively we can, through the transition, keep prices low, knowing that maybe 15 years from now there is uh, more battery storage that's available. Uh, there are better renewables that are not as intermittent or that have more control with them. So um, this is probably the first time in 105 years that the way in which we do electricity and the way in which we provide that infrastructure to our customers is changing dramatically, and the, the business model and the mental model that we have to have to think about how to work with government on the policy, uh, work with our customers on the pricing, work with the investment community on the, on the financing, and then pick the right project and get it built right in, 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 in with, you know, with the right governance and, and with the right commercial outcomes. Um, is really the challenge we face. So that's that's, what, that's how great. I wanted to get the uh, conversation that's great, started. Donna. That's a great opening, so thank you. Um, let me just throw out a few questions to each of the panelists and then we'll open it up. Bert, let me start with you because there's been a lot of conversation this morning. A couple of panelists have mentioned the idea of an infrastructure bank. You mentioned the role that IO already plays with regard to loans and I think eight nine billion dollars is out municipalities and other organizations with regard to loans so I guess the question I have about a federal infrastructure bank is how much overlap if any would there be and is there a bigger role for the federal government with regard to some of the other space that you play the successful p3 delivery private sector development and other steps with regard to that maybe you could sure yeah I think um, I think there are there are two things I could see an infrastructure bank or infrastructure agency doing, uh, and they'd look a lot like what we do. The, the first is, you know, the federal government has a, has a real estate portfolio that's bigger than ours. Th they will always be building courts and RCMP facilities and laboratories and, and government office buildings and, and so on. They've got, uh, they also have uh, 
border crossings, military, uh, military infrastructure. There's huge needs in terms of the uh, First Nations infrastructure. I think there's a, you know, a, a federal program that, that could be launched if there was an agency. Uh, and as I say, it's not, you, you can't, it's, it's not realistic to plan a program if you have no capability of delivering it. I think, frankly, one of the, one of the reasons you know, we ended up with the backlog that we did in transit and, and, uh, and healthcare in Ontario is you know, governments looked at projects and you know, what, what ought to be good news, and cutting a new ribbon in a new, new, new uh, project, they actually viewed as, you know, as terrifying that it would go, go badly. So I think the first thing they could be doing is, is delivering all of those federal pro projects in a consistent way through that agency. I'd also encourage them to think about uh, you know, lending to us, uh, and there are there are I/O equivalents, frankly, across the country and other in, in, in other other provinces that that do consolidated lending for the for the municipalities. They'd be taking uh, they'd be taking provincial credit. That's a pretty low risk, and we take, frankly, municipal credit in Ontario. I'm not sure there's been a a municipality that's gone bankrupt. Uh, and you know, in today's world, someone might say, well, you know, interest rates are already low, but I'd, I'd say yes, but the the 100 to 150 basis point difference then between what municipalities borrow at and what the federal government may end up being, you know, may end up having their 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 borrowing costs. Um, so I think those are the, the two things. There's a there's a there's a lot of talk about uh, you know private finance and the role for private finance and infrastructure. And the only ca caution I'd have on that is infrastructure is a pretty broad. Uh, term, you know, it can be, uh, you know, energy pipelines, power, power, power uh, generation, power transmission, uh, cable, broadband, you know, to schools, police stations, hospitals, uh, you know, LRTs and roads. And I think uh, it's dangerous if you start the conversation asking yourself, well, how do we finance this? You know, I think you have to start with, well, what is it we're trying to build? Uh, and so, for instance, in, in Ontario, um, you know, we're, we're building, you know, fr frankly, the, mostly what we've been building is things that are ultimately paid for government because of pretty, pretty deep-seated, deep uh, you know, public policy. Hospitals are public, you know, jails are public, OPP schools. detachments are to schools, you know, forensic centers, uh, and frankly, even, you know, public transit in, in almost all jurisdictions the, the operating, the, the fare box may cover the operating cost or some portion of it, but it's rare that it covers any of the capital costs. And so almost everything we're building is going to be paid for by the government. And that doesn't mean that we use no private finance, but we're very judicious in our use of private finance because there is a, a readily and pretty obvious alternative, which is to publicly borrow. And so when we when we build projects and access private finance, we actually don't spend any time thinking about how do we privately finance this. Uh, we, we think about how do we how do we make sure we transfer the risk associated with designing this project, building this project, operating this project, and often that means, you know, f frankly, withholding money from the builder during construction and during the operating period, so that you have some leverage because there's. You know, there's nothing like having someone's money to give you leverage at the table. And governments don't like lawsuits. And so, you know, when projects don't go badly and they've fully paid for them, they don't often chase people down. Um, so that's why we private, privately finance. But if you actually look at our projects, there's, there, it, there, the vast majority of the financing is actually public in our, in our projects. And, you know, some people, I think, frankly, overstate both the benefits and costs of, of finance in our deals. So anyway, I think it's, so there's a lot of discussion right now around infrastructure and people use the term infrastructure and then they get into a conversation about finance and I think, you know, we may be getting ahead of ourselves here. It may be, may be better to back up and say, well, what is it we're building? And then have the conversation about finance. Well, what about the issues of actually putting a greater amount of the cost on the user? If you look statistically, and there aren't great stats on this, the degree to which other countries actually impose a cost on users, road tolls, which can be very politically challenging, full cost on water. You look at 
places like London and Stockholm that have congestion charges, other steps that are taken. Electricity obviously has a different history. The Canada line's interesting and the capacity there. Thoughts with regard to that? Because other, my sense is that other countries who've moved faster to put greater cost on the user, the term that's used often is demand management. Obviously, you're putting, letting the market play in a stronger way, but there's significant political pushback in those circumstances because there is a, a strong perception from the public that the asset was free, now it's not free. It can be a big political issue. Thoughts with regard to that? I don't know, Jane. Just picking up on a little bit of what Bert said, and, and it sort of ties into your remark, and, and maybe if I could just push back a wee bit. Um, I think it's fine to say that um, much of this infrastructure, for whatever reason, requires some sort of broad public subsidy, as distinct from user fees, targeting the people that are actually benefiting directly from that infrastructure. So think about transit fares, the fare being paid by the user, versus you know, the greater taxpayer base subsidizing, as Bert's already said, the capital cost. And quite right to say, like a lot of things in Canada, because as David Emerson used to say, it's a long, skinny trading com country. And there's, you know, we're subsidizing everything, whether it's CBC or transit. I mean, it's just a nature and part of our geography. And for me, it's one thing to say, well, much of this infrastructure will require a subsidy from the greater tax base. And it's another thing to say, but we're going to understand exactly what that subsidy looks like. And we're going to apply the kind of rigor to that analysis that we would apply if we were doing it with private sector finance, whether we ultimately use private sector finance or not, and I agree with you, it's not about the cost of capital particularly, more about the risk share. But I think having the private sector at the table, either sort of metaphorically or in reality, does give us um, a more rigorous examination of where we could have user fees or a proxy for user fees in some cases, an availability payment for a toll road, something like that. Um, and, and where indeed we do have to subsidize but I think we could be much more efficient if we look through a microscope at that question. We may decide, you know what, we can't crank transit fares anymore. We're right at the max. We're going to start to affect demand, and our whole analysis is going to, you know, it's, it's not going to hold water. Fair enough. But let's look at it. Let's spend the time figuring out, is there a revenue stream? What does that look like? How could we tweak the project to take advantage of that revenue stream? And I just think that we... I, I don't want us to become complacent. I would rather that that analysis be crisp. And I think that it almost for sure will end up more focused on user fees, but at the very least we'll have a much more rigorous sort of analytical approach to our projects around how we're building. Don and then Bird, if we could. I mean, you know, always in electricity, and it doesn't matter if electricity is provided by the private sector or it's in a crown corporation in one of the provinces here. But electricity always ends up at a price to the, to the rate payer. So uh, in British Columbia, it's uh, a regulated price to the rate payer. In Alberta, it's a market price. Um, <clears throat> and the reality is when you get the right price signals to the customer, you get the right demand response, and you, get, you, you really do get the right allocation of capital to the right assets. I think um, what we're seeing, I, I think what's very, very interesting that's, that's coming in the future is if you look at the evolution of the industry in the last um, 10 years, uh, policymakers have been pushing renewables into the system using subsidies. There, there's a huge, the, the reason that wind and solar have become much cheaper over the last 10 years, faster than any other electricity resource, is worldwide they've been globally pushed into the system using subsidies. So I'll give you a statistic that I was uh, shocked by. Um, I'm going to Germany, um, and I'm going to meet with uh, one of the presidents of the big companies there. And he told me that in Germany today, uh, the German government pays $27 billion of euros, 27 billion euros per year, on the subsidies for the renewables that are in Germany. So on any given day, you've got 80% renewables running which are subsidized, subsidized by government, and consumers are actually paying for that through their tax, through the tax system, so they don't really see it. And then on another day, it's 80% of it is from the thermal plants, which their market has crashed. None of those plants are making any returns, and likely, unless they do some other kind of support for the thermal side, they'll start closing those plants down. And the consumer pays for that. So the consumer is actually underpaying 
for the price signal because they can't actually see what they're paying for. Now, I think what's, what Canada is doing and what Alberta is doing is, is we're getting ahead of that. So there has been some subsidized renewables programs in, in the country, and, and certainly we have projects across this country where we have long-term power purchase arrangements with Crown corporations that have a subsidy built into them. But in Alberta, with the, with the carbon tax that we've put in place, um, what you're going to see is that you actually have to stop thinking about subsidizing renewables because the carbon price in itself prices in the environmental externality and it gives the right price signal. And so you have to be very careful on the policy side not to get policy pan pancaking on top of each other. Because once you do that, you start making inefficient decisions around, around the technology and around infrastructure. You build too much infrastructure for, you, for what you really need. So it's going to be interesting as we play that out over the next uh, 15 years in the Alberta market. But I would say, I would push back as well. Um, I'm not as polite as Jane, but I'm from Alberta. We're, we're crazy there. But um, what I would say is, and I'll, I'll give you an example in our sector. If you build a merchant plant, merchant gas plant in the Alberta market, you need about $80 a megawatt hour to cover the risk of the financing. If you build that on a, in a contracted way with, with using pension fund money and with any kind of uh, support from an infrastructure bank that would just buy down the cost of the debt slightly, you could get that cost into the $55 to $60 range. And our customers want the $55 to $60 range. They do not want to pay boardwalk prices for electricity on the board. They, they want a, just a nice stable price over a long period of time. Because, and they want the reliability of that price so they can build their businesses with certainty on top of that infrastructure. And that's why I think we have to be very careful as we're building infrastructure in this country to A, pick it well, but B, finance it well as well. Just, Bert, I'm not, uh, maybe I wasn't clear. There's a, I don't have any issue with private financing of power generation, power transmission. Yeah, you're thinking about private. I think, I think the danger is that exactly what happened just here, people use the word infrastructure and think, you know, oh, it's all infrastructure is infrastructure, let's get it privately financed. They pay for, they pay for power generation, why don't we get them to pay for hospitals? It's a, it, it, because of deep public policy that we have, that's not going to happen. The, the, you know, whether the, the, the commercial opportunities, you know, associated with the, the Tim Hortons in the basement and the parking garage outside are not going to pay, pay for the parking. And I'd say, you know, we, we need to step back and say, what is the public infrastructure that people are keen to see built over the next 10, 10 years? You know, if it's, if it's affordable housing and it's, uh, you know, berms along, along waterways, you know, essentially piling mud or public transit, what are the real opportunities here for private finance? Let's not start with, well, there's, there is private finance. They're building, you know, power generation in Alberta. I get that. So, and, and I think that goes to the point of sort of the necessity of long-term planning. Infrastructure is forever, and it's unfortunate that I'd argue over the last, especially since the Great Recession, we've seen the term shovel-ready come to the fore, and infrastructure was turned into a stimulus program by and large, or there was a perception that infrastructure was seen by and large as a stimulus program. Even back in 2008, 2009, Infrastructure spending, particularly from the provinces and municipalities, the feds as well, had grown to a point that the stimulus funding for infrastructure was a significant top-up. But, you know, this term shovel-ready goes around, and there's a sense that infrastructure is for the short term, when in fact there are very few things that are really more substantial for the long term. So to your point, Bert, thinking about what Canada is going to look like in 2045, and spending towards that, analyzing demographically, geographically, environmentally, technologically, and doing that kind of work. And to my mind, that's the necessity of doing a long-term infrastructure plan. And other countries have already done that, done numerous ones, New Zealand, for example. And in the report, um, we talk about other, what I thought, others thought were best practices. And Don, I want to turn to you because Transalta does so much stuff internationally. I know you've got some thoughts about the ease of operating within your sector in Canada and elsewhere. One of the best practices that I cite is from Australia, infrastructure Australia, in terms of the professionalization, 
the depoliticization, if you like, in certain ways of many of the things we're talking about. So if you would just sort of compare Canada to your experiences elsewhere. <coughs> Excuse me, we, uh, we've invested over a billion uh, dollars in, in Western Australia in the last uh, five years, um, mostly in power plants that are behind the fence for the miners uh, in that, the miners for the iron ore people. Um, but also we support nickel mines and gold mines. <coughs> but we've, we've also, as, as part of that, in, in Western Australia is very big. It's a big moonscape. Um, everything's far apart. There's no way to really bring everything together with transmissions. So you end up, you end up running a lot of these mines on diesel. Uh, so we talked one of our customers into bringing gas to the station because natural gas, <coughs> because natural gas is, um, is a much cleaner fuel. And, and, and this was cheaper than the diesel, and we wanted to get them that economic <laughs> benefit. So they ran a process, and we partnered with somebody over there, and it was for 165 kilometers uh, of gas from the coast into the mine. So it was a, it was a, it was a long project. Um, we started that project. We were chosen, uh, and we permitted and built the project and, and commissioned it in 18 months. Now, you can't... I'm looking at trying to do some stuff here in Canada, and the earliest that I can get 50 kilometers of gas built in Canada is three years. Uh, for 50 kilometers, I'm talking like a spur of gas. Uh, so w when we look at the Australian market, we just see tremendous things. We had an earlier panelist uh, talk about his problem immigrating here. They have labor market. Um, agreements already set up in place because they know that they have to bring people in from Asia and from Africa to work in Western Australia because they always have a big balloon of people when, when the mining goes crazy. So they bring people in and they, and they leave. Uh, they've got that all set up on agreements. They know exactly how that works. Uh, they, our First Nations agreement, we, we did our First Nations agreements in the 16 months. So we not only got the permits, got our First Nations agreements, got our, uh, and, and you know, did our, our project. We constructed the project, commissioned it, and started it. So, and again, because they spent the time up front negotiating with their First Nations how they were gonna do infrastructure. So they are, they're, they're not just a little bit ahead of Canada, they're light years ahead of us in terms of, of the ability to get things done. Uh, and I think they have uh, sort of a common vision about what they're trying to do. And I keep, you know, I go over there and I think, why is this so different? And I think it's different there because they have the Chinese and they just know that if they're not on top of it, they won't have a standard of living. And they are crystal clear about what it takes to compete. And I think when we're here in Canada, I think we really have a, potentially a sense that we just got lots of time and it'll all come our way and it'll work out in the end and we'll have lots of discussions, but eventually it will get there. So I don't see us moving forward and solving these issues so that we can set up those enabling frameworks the way they have. So I'm very, very impressed with what they do. I'm going to ask you, uh, there's four microphones, I think, so please think about questions. Come forward. In the meantime, Jane, let me ask you uh, one final question before we go to the audience. You mentioned, I think, 15 projects and factors, you know, some that go well, some that don't. Canada Line in particular is something you know, many of the Infrastructure Ontario projects are looked at as sort of top class. Canada Line has done very well. What were the factors with regard to Canada Line, if you would, that made it go as well as it did? And maybe you could, you know, broaden that a little bit to the factors more generally that you were thinking about when you made that reference. Some of them I've touched on already. I think, I think to Don's point, we had the right, we had the right project. I mean, it was a, it wasn't, uh, we were talking just before we came in uh, about white elephants that, one often hears about in infrastructure conversations. And I think the first thing is always to have a good project. And it sounds, sounds straightforward, but um, for all the reasons that we've talked about and that you note in the report, sometimes the motivations aren't necessarily well placed, if I could say that from an infrastructure perspective. And so sometimes you don't end, start with a good project. But we started with a good project. It was a very well-developed corridor connecting two um, very well-developed uh, areas and the airport in between. So that was, that was one. Uh, two, we, we did get the governance right, if I say, can say so. We, we nailed it. And we, we did so because, as I said earlier, we, 
I really had to take into account the interests of each of the federal, federal provincial, and regional governments, uh, as well as the airport authority, who didn't trust any of the governments. You can imagine that dynamic. And so it really was a question of having a conversation with each of your shareholders and saying, what is it that you care about this project, and what decisions do you want to make, and what decisions don't you want to make? And the feds don't want to make the same decisions as the airport authority wants to make, and the airport authority doesn't make the same decision that the regional authority wants to make. But it's, it's not very sexy. It's just a very detailed conversation that you would have if you were trying to set up a company with shareholders or investors around what is it you care about and what you don't. And then once you figured that out, what mechanism are you going to use by way of a governance board, or I, I happen to like a board of directors because I'm sort of more comfortable in a corf corporate sphere. It doesn't really matter. It's whatever that entity is that's going to take a certain amount of authority that's been delegated to it and be able to make decisions in a timely way. And we were fortunate because we put the time into investing in that early and setting the stage in terms of the expectations of the shareholders. And then once in place, we were um, blessed with a very good board, um, a little bit like the I.O. board, I suspect, um, very skilled uh, people in various disciplines. And they, together with, um, with uh, the management team, were able to take timely decisions and allow us to deliver. And then the third thing is just back to the capacity question. I think in some respects, all these things feed on each other. So it's a good project, and you put into place a good governance model, and then you can attract good project people because they just want to come and build projects. It's exactly what Bert said. They, most people <clears throat> that like building big projects, whether they're finance guys or engineers or community relations, stakeholder relations folks, they like good projects, and they know a good governance model when they see it, and they want to come work on those projects. And then you've got the capacity. And I think those three elements probably were big contributing factors. That's great. Bert, you had a thought? And yeah, then sure. I know we, we have a question we, here. Uh, we certainly, th this is what we spend our time thinking about. How do you make big projects go better? And, uh, you know, there are a few things. I think first, as you say, getting the right people. You know, the, the public sector has fantastic people in it, but the core competency of the, the public sector and the best public servants is orchestrating decisions and doing, you know, budgets and public policy and legislation and regulation, things that, you know, have nothing to do, frankly, with delivering big projects. If you are going to be in the big project business, if a government's going to undertake a big program, they better hire the same people that Dawn would hire to do her projects. That can be a bit of a challenge given, you know, public sector compensation. Uh, but if you don't get the right people, you're in, you're in big trouble. Um, I'd say picking the right partners is key. That might sound pretty obvious. In the, in the public sector, there are trade trade regulations and uh, procurement rules that frankly you don't place any priority on on picking the right partner they place extreme priority on fairness and open and openness and transparency all of which are good things but you can have a a, a fair open and transparent process that le leads to a absurd result um, and you know you need to try and find that balance and make sure that the people you pick as partners will actually behave like partners when the project goes badly, because if you're doing big projects, they will go badly at some point. Um, those are two big things we, we did. A, a, another big one that may, may sound obvious is don't take a big project and chop it up into small projects. The, uh, the, the public sector has a, a tendency to do that. I think a lot of that is driven by wanting to you know, distribute the work around to local, local guys. You know, the classic example there is the big dig in Boston where they start off at a you know, couple billion dollars and they end up at 12 or 13 billion dollars because they have 100 contracts and they're sitting in the middle of it trying to, trying to integrate the risk, which is, that is the big risk. Uh, so we don't do that anymore. We tender out, if, it, if there's a big project, it gets tendered as a big project, not as six small projects. Um, and then lastly, as I say, that there's, there's more focus on this than there probably ought to be, but uh, uh, as a tool, because it's one, one of many, is we, we don't pay uh, until the project is done or we withhold a significant amount of the money, amount of money. And, you know, as I said, the, the public sector is reluctant to get into lawsuits and public disputes with people. This is a tool that we found, you know, our shareholders actually quite comfortable uh, using. You know, they, if the thing didn't get built, uh, they don't pay. They're comfortable doing that. They're not so comfortable getting into lawsuits because that gets this all out in the public, and so they just hope this thing passes quickly. The same is true in the as we go into the operating phase. We withhold money because there's a, as I say, a tendency in the public sector to build the thing and then not put a dime into it for the next 30 years until it's run into the ground. 
And that's a very expensive way to operate, uh, operate assets. You're, you're, it's way, way more expensive. And so we, we force, uh, often force the person who's building it to maintain it. And that's as much to, to, frankly, tie the hands of the government to say, you have to maintain this asset. It doesn't, you, you can't build it and then run it into the ground. Um, so those are the big things we do. That's an important point, I think, the incentive to maintain the asset. Um, and the benefit of that and the structure within P3s, I think, has, has proven itself very strongly, and certainly in Ontario, and I know of federal assets that just haven't been maintained over time. People think the government pays itself first, and sometimes, in some cases, they pay themselves last. Question from the audience here. Thank you. My name is Martin Hull from uh, Infrastructure Canada. Um, Earlier today, we, uh, we saw a picture with uh, workers around uh, the railways uh, that will be, was going to be built from coast to coast 150 years ago. And uh, many uh, panel, panelists refers to uh, the huge amount of infrastructure money spent in the 50s and 60s to build from scratch roads, bridges, and uh, other kind of uh, structures. Uh, my question to you now, because of we're ref we've been referring a num numerous times to the, the thing that what we're doing in terms of infrastructure spending is less sexy these days because it's not new stuff, but it's to replace old infrastructure by new one for, the, for a lot of, uh, large part. Is there a risk, according to you, of uh, maybe overestimate the uh, uh, economic benefits of this? Infra the, this new infrastructure spending today compared to what occurred 50 years ago or 60 years ago. Thank you. Who wants to take that on, Tom? Well, I, I mean, I, can, I, I think I can start and add to the dialogue. I certainly don't have an answer to your question. You know, I think what you're, you're pointing to is the really deep, hard, tough economic analysis about whether or not the project has true returns against the build it and they will come model. And in my career, I can say both things turned out to be true. So I think you can, you can find infrastructure. I mean, I, th I think I have a nose for infrastructure because I'm the most impatient person in the world. So I know where every lineup is in Canada. I, if I was going to go after productivity in Canada, I would go after the security infrastructure at the airports first. <laughs> right? I would. I, I mean, I, I, I have a lot of work to do and I got a lot of things to take care of at home and when I'm standing in the security lineup for two hours and I have to be at the airport early to get to the security lineup, to get through it, to get to the plane, all that stuff is wasting my time and it's wasting all of your time, right? So to me, number one infrastructure project, new, new, new infrastructure around security and then you've suddenly freed up a whole bunch of people's time. So that I could do deep analysis on and I could show that our GDP would go up by at least 3% a year if we did that. <laughs> On the other side of it, um, and I, I worked at BC Hydro as part of my career, and I worked on what was called the Columbia River Treaty. And basically in the 60s, BC Hydro built these beautiful dams on the, on the Columbia River up at uh, Revelstoke and, and Micah Creek. And when they got them done, they couldn't pay for them. They were way too expensive. They were way over their skis. So they did a deal with the Americans where they, they got money to buy down the debt, and they sold 30 years of power. And I did the agreements when we got the power back. Um, but today, BC has those dams are absolute crown jewels in, in the infrastructure here in Canada. So at the time, they were built it, and they will come way too expensive white elephants. But they found their way through it, and now they're the lowest cost uh, hydro assets anywhere on the planet. So I, I think there's a case, in my view, for deep analytics, and I think there's sometimes a case for a railway that brings the country together and makes it a railway, and I think you have to have both. Can I use an example, another cross-border example that I've read a little bit about recently? And that's the St. Lawrence Seaway. And the results of the St. Lawrence Seaway, and I'm not sure how well this is known, um, are not nearly what we expected in the 50s and 60s when it was being built and completed. And part of the challenge for that was if, they had been, if it had been built in the 20s when we on this side of the border first started pushing the Americans to uh, do what was necessarily on the, necessary on the St. Lawrence Seaway, it probably would have had a great economic return. It took 30 years of bilateral negotiation with the Americans to actually get them 
to do the Seaway. The Seaway didn't matter nearly as much to them as it did to us. And by the time it was actually completed in the late 50s, we were starting to move to the kind of containerization and other steps that made it less necessary. It took essentially 30 or 40 years to do it, although the construction took five. And as soon as it was built, um, it was already past due. And in fact, it's never come close to the kind of numbers that we uh, expected to happen. So looking really, really long term and thinking about this is ob obviously fundamental. We have a question on, uh, on Twitter. We've got about 10 minutes left. And it was, is there an ideal means by which the federal government, the provincial government, municipal governments can work together um, and really prioritize their spend and coordinate to best effect? I do, if I could, just very briefly before turning to one of you, I do touch on that in the report. And a couple of things that I found really striking, and Bert, I know you've been involved with the municipal sector in terms of the loan program. Provinces set debt limits with regard to municipalities. And there's been some work lately with regard to the degree to which cities big and small across the country are willing to finance their infrastructure with debt. There's some academic uh, material that says that to a sizable extent, not always, but to a sizable extent, municipalities have been very loath to do that. Much more willing to look at the provincial and federal governments with regard to transfer payments, not nearly as willing to take on the responsibilities themselves. So I would argue that that's one area that we could coordinate better. What about in terms of actually the province and the federal government with regard to coordinating? I guess we talked about that a little bit, economic infrastructure, hospitals and schools maybe, but. Well, I, I mean, I think if, if you're talking about building, um, I don't think you want too many cooks in the kitchen. So, you know, there are, you know, there are projects we're delivering, provincial projects that may end up with federal funding. I'm not sure you want to have multiple agencies trying to deliver the, the, the project. Um, and so I'd, I'd, I'd be careful on that front. I think there's, there's lots for the federal government to do in terms of delivering its own pro projects without, without going into jurisdictions that are already quite competently delivering their projects. I think there are there are uh, there are provinces though that don't have a lot of experience delivering big projects and probably probably couldn't you know where it wouldn't make sense for them to set up an IO type agency and in the past organizations like you know, frankly partnerships BC have you know gone to the territories and whatnot helping them to deliver big projects that might be a role that's that's uh, that's appropriate for the federal government. I would echo just echo Bert's Point, I think it's important not to have multiple delivery agencies on one project. I mean, clearly that's the point about governance. Someone's got to be in charge and everybody has to understand what their role is relative to that agency that's delivering the project. But I do think that there is a role for the federal government first in this planning exercise that you touch on in the report around nationally what is it we're trying to accomplish and, and within that broader framework, longer term, you know, what does that say about what each province or what each sector is trying to accomplish? I think there's certainly a role there. And there's no question that the, that the federal government um, has an opportunity, I think, because frankly, they're writing checks. And so I think like any check writer, whether you call yourself a grantor or I would prefer to say an investor, if you're writing checks, you have skin in the game. And I think you're allowed to say, hang on a minute, we're gonna bring the bar up in terms of how we choose and how we deliver these projects. And if that means you know, you, you're not capable because you just are too small or you haven't had an opportunity to build that capacity, we'll help you with that. We'll help you together bring the bar up. But I don't see any problem with the federal government for my money saying, wait a minute, we're gonna put this kind of money out the door in the next 10 years, we get to say, there's some governance checklists you have to hit. There's some expertise that you have to have and you can have it through IO and they can deliver it. You'd probably get the box checked pretty quickly. But if, if not, you know, where is your, where is your delivery mechanism and is it, is it war warrant my, my check? Bingo, Wilson. Um, we've heard today words of, uh, you know, innovation, inclusive growth, infrastructure banks, infrastructure agencies, a good project. I love, 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 love that term. Uh, where do those things meet? Should the infrastructure bank or agency um, stick to what I've heard affectionately called big cement projects? Or is this our opportunity to actually uh, achieve more with a, uh, a sort of a, a milestone infrastructure investment program? 
Yeah. Your, pa you want a, your paper. So, um, no, I don't think it's about cement. So if you're going to build an agency, and I point to Infrastructure Australia in this regard, but there are others that have done this. You know, the capacity building, and there is great capacity already in the country. Bert's mentioned, you know, talked about I.O., partnerships, B.C., there's other examples. But nobody has knitted together on a national basis. So when Jane says, if the federal government, which has real money on the table now, far more than they had 10, 12 years ago, um, is going to put that kind of funding at work, maybe they should be thinking, as our Infrastructure Australia does, of only providing those in certain circumstances. So I'll give you one example. State governments, municipal governments that are looking for federal funding need to have um, delivery mechanisms in place, individuals who've gone through programs at the federal level to ensure that there's confidence that they can deliver these effectively. There needs to be a projects over a certain scale, $100 million in the case of Australia, perhaps that's appropriate here as well. A public, substantial business plan um, that's also already gone into um, public consultations and real strong ROI investment uh, analysis, a strong business case. That's often done here but it's not always done here. And the issue of transparency and the issue of reporting back on delivery and operations is, I would argue, based on the evidence I've seen, stronger there than here. So I think there really are some federal mechanisms that the government may want to think about as they increase their spend, recognizing that even at $120 billion, that's still only 16 17% of what we expect the three levels of government to spend over the next 10 years. Don. I think that's I think that's a great question uh, because I you know I can't help but thinking about what's going on right now. So you take, for example, Sorry. Airbnb. So you're you're in the hotel business. You're building great big hotels all over the world. They're beautiful. They've got great lobbies. They've got bars. They've got great rooms. And Airbnb comes along, and the next thing you know, all your clients are living in the basements of the people in the suburbs for 120 bucks a night in London, right? and your, your hotel is empty. So you built the cement, and the technology came along to take away your market. So I, I don't know that I actually agree with the word plan, infrastructure plan, because I've been in electricity for 30 years. We've been planning electricity s uh, systems for 30 years, and we have missed it every year for 30 years. Like, mm -hmm. So either we're really bad planners after trying for 30 years, where plans don't work all that well because they don't account for, for innovation. So I do think there is something that you have to do to say, okay, what could the long term look like? And we got to sketch it out. But there is uh, a real need to think about what the innovations will be that could potentially replace the need for the, for the bricks and the mortar and for the cement that are also infrastructure investments that will make us more productive uh, that can be somehow funded either through public or pub public and private investment. Uh, so I think there's a huge role for innovation, and I think if we think about infrastructure as just more roads and highways and big buildings and all the rest of it, we will spend too much money in this country, and it will be too expensive, and we won't be competitive. Um, and I, I just think that would be a terrible shame to, to waste all that capital. Time's up. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Jane and Bert and Don.